I'm Afshin Ratansi. We're going underground 48 hours before U.S. Vice President Mike Pence debates with Democrat contender and former California death penalty defender Kamala Harris in Utah. Coming up in the show. Will Pence Harris attract as much disbelief as Trump Biden? And are Biden and Harris taking Sanders supporters for granted? Now Obama's vice president is on the record for refusing to support the new Green Deal and characterizing racist American policing as a few bad apples amidst Black Lives Matter's rage on the streets of the USA. All this and more coming up in today's Going Underground, but first away from the mainstream media, winners and losers speculation around the vice presidential debate in 48 hours time is the real loser progressive politics in the USA, especially now Biden said he didn't support a new Green Deal and claims a country infamous for imprisoning more per capita than Stalin or Mao has a policing system with a few bad apples, not institutional racism. Today, the Trump administration terminates the US 2020 census and one comedian and activist who has fought for census reform and Bernie Sanders is Palestinian American comedian Amr Zaha. Thank you so much, uh, Amr, for coming on. So. Uh, even though we're looking forward to the Veep debate, I've got to ask you, uh, what did you think of the uh, great uh, show of democracy in Ohio last week where uh, your top politicians in, in your country debated the issues of the day? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't very um, promising or uh, exciting if you're an American who's interested in democracy. I mean, look, it was chaotic and probably a lot of that helps Donald Trump. I mean, the chaos is something that he looks forward to because talking about actual policies doesn't help him. And Biden didn't do a great job, I think, either. I think the biggest sort of losers in this debate were progressives. When Biden says, as a centrist who still is subject to a lot of criticism from the left, when he says to Donald Trump, sort of reassuring many Americans that I, he said, I am the Democratic Party, that's not something that progressives like to hear. The Republican Party has outperformed its popular support over the years because it's always appealed to its base and looked ways to expand rightward. And the Democratic Party hasn't looked at to how to expand leftward. Instead, it always focuses on the center. And that's always very muddy and loses a lot of potential support from the left. A lot of the commentators, the pro-Democrat commentators, said uh, Biden did well by not losing arguably. But uh, on the progressive issues uh, you mentioned, given that Kamala Harris has expressed support previously for the Green New Deal and the world has seen the pictures of the wildfires in the United States, the climate crisis being arguably the existential threat to the earth, how is she going to uh, triangulate a position of not supporting the Green New Deal on Wednesday? Well, unfortunately, the whole Biden-Harris campaign and Biden from the beginning and now Harris since she's jumped on, I mean, let's not forget, she supported the Green New Deal, then she didn't. She supported Medicare for all, and then she didn't. You know, this whole campaign from the Democrats has been predicated on appealing to this sort of middle of the road and I think sort of imaginary independent voter, which, um, you know, has sort of reliably voted Republican over the last few cycles. Why did Obama win decisively twice? because despite his shortcomings in actual policy, he campaigned to the left. He campaigned to progressivism and hope and change and these kinds of things. Biden's not doing that at all. Biden is openly saying, and Harris now that she's joining him, are openly saying, look, we're campaigning to the center. These ideas that Bernie Sanders had, I'm sure we're sort of giving them a little bit of lip service, but we're not really gonna do any of those things. The Harris-Pence campaign will have less fireworks because it doesn't include Donald Trump, but it's going to be substantially very similar. This debate coming up with uh, Harris and Pence might be even more disappointing to progressives because it'll be a lot clearer what's happening. We don't have the tapes yet from the DNC, from uh, WikiLeaks, like we did in 2016 when it was exposed how they were sabotaging Bernie Sanders, who you were a surrogate of. But uh, surely there is electoral sense here. The fact is Biden and Harris can take your vote for granted and all Sanders supporters vote for granted anyway. Yeah, I mean, that is the way they seem to be campaigning. And I don't know why they didn't learn the lessons of 2016 or simply look at what the Republicans have done over the years to overperform. The way that you win a campaign is that you expand your base and expand the people that you appeal to. What Bernie Sanders did successfully, and as he brought in people who had not been involved in the electoral process before, that's why he would be killing Trump right now, because he'd have traditional Democratic voters 
and an expanded base of brand new voters. What Biden did very quickly is he constricted that progressive base, told them, look, you're not really welcome here. I'm not gonna be with Medicare for all. I'm not gonna be with a Green New Deal. I'm not gonna say that people shouldn't die simply because they can't afford their health care. I'm gonna stick to private health care. I'm gonna be very hawkish uh, with Israel. I'm not gonna talk clearly about Palestinian rights. All these things, right? He's gonna appeal to the middle, well, that is a recipe for loss. And what they're saying to us is you have to vote for us. No, we don't. You know, no, we don't. I mean, look, I'm probably going to walk into a voting booth in Michigan in November, and I'm probably going to vote for Joe Biden. But I still have two more debates to watch, and I still have to worry about my community. And my community, the Arab American community, which is very large here, especially in Michigan, is not just going to blindly go along with Biden because he's not Trump. Okay, Trump is terrible. We don't really look at Trump. We don't look at the GOP because they don't look at us. But if the Democrats are going to look at us as Arab Americans and as progressives, as a voting bloc, then they need to treat us with the respect that we deserve. Okay, we didn't hear too much about foreign policy at that debate. Perhaps the next uh, presidential debate we will. What do you make of this man, Anthony Blinken, who was a uh, top aide to Biden when uh, he voted for the Iraq war? I understand he's a top foreign policy advisor during this election campaign, probably a seat at the table uh, in the Oval Office should uh, Biden win. He said the 2002 vote for the illegal Iraq war was a vote for tough diplomacy. Well, he's still the top foreign policy advisor for the Biden campaign. He's If Biden wins, he'll probably be a national security advisor or something like that. And yes, he is hawkish. There is a sort of cabal of neoliberal hawkish foreign policy people that are at the center of the Biden foreign policy thinking. And this is very dangerous, especially for the Arab world and the Muslim world. I mean, say what you want about Trump. He has a lot of terrible things about him, especially domestically. But he's sort of like an isolationist when it comes to military action. And he hasn't engaged in a lot of military action, at least as far as American standards go, in the last four years, and especially in the Arab world. And so it's very fearful, actually, for a Biden foreign policy. And you have Tony Blinken, who told Arab American and Palestinian communities this year that Palestinians are to blame for our problems. He told us that he repeated these lines of never missing an opportunity to miss an opportunity. He told us that one of the conditions of the Biden campaign or the Biden administration on Palestinians will be ha to have to uh, outwardly accept that Israel is a Jewish state. These are non-starters for Palestinians. Not one word about occupation. Remember, this is a campaign, a foreign policy led by Blinken and Biden that refused to include the word occupation in the Democratic Party platform. So where are we going to be left? Okay, we're going to be left with an administration that doesn't completely shut us out like the Trump administration, but in some ways, is that worse when they let you in the door and, and say that they did and still don't do anything you want? Some people in our community believe that it's better to st remain oppositional on the outside, that we can get more solidarity from other communities by being on the outside and remaining oppositional than playing a game with an administration that has 50 years of experience of protecting Israel from any criticism in the world. We need to criticize the Biden platform now. If he wins, let him know that we were not taken for granted and that we need to be included clearly in the new administration and our objections need to be preserved. If anyone wants to watch your amazing video about uh, Arab Americans, they, they should definitely. If you want to just tell me about that, especially on this census day. But I think what I'm getting at here is we don't really know how many Arab Americans there are. And if they don't vote for Biden, we know how small the swings were that brought Trump to power. Could actually, ironically, Arab Americans be critical to electing Biden in the first place? Yeah, I mean, we could, you know, we're, we're hundreds of thousands uh, strong here in Michigan and Michigan could be the state that it all comes down to. And it's not only Michigan. We have strong communities in Florida, which is a swing state and Pennsylvania as well. And so the question is, look, you want to get into a booth secretly and vote for Biden? That's fine. But celebrating him and organizing for him is a major, major endorsement without getting anything in return. 
yeah, I might vote for Biden, but I'm not going to endorse him or organize for him. In fact, quite the opposite. I'm going to keep questioning him and criticizing him up until and after election day so he knows that we're not something to be taken for granted if he wins. As Arab Americans, we can swing this election. Maybe we did in 2016 when Trump only won Michigan by 10,000 votes. And I live in a neighborhood here in Dear Dearborn, Michigan, that has more than 10,000 Arabs just in this neighborhood. So, I mean, they have to be very careful. They can not take us for granted. And sometimes I'm worried about our own community because Biden muttered, inshallah, at the debate with Trump. And all of a sudden, a lot of people went crazy. Oh, my God, he said a word in Arabic. <laughs> well, what does that matter when he is telling Palestinians that they don't deserve the same human rights as Israelis when he is still saying that he wants to have strong relations with the Saudi government, when he is still, you know, praising these normalization deals with the UAE and Bahrain? We have to be very careful not to accept crumbs. You know, I, I like hummus or saying inshallah is not That's a policy. Enough. That's enough for you guys, surely. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, of course, the, the, you alluded to it, that the Obama-Biden administration was brutal on the Arab world. I mean, you look at Libya today, we have a refugee crisis in the Mediterranean. Um, do you think in any way that Biden would change his stance on being a Zionist, on the move of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem, of, uh, of reducing weapons sales to Israel that are hitting Gaza? He's actually said, on the record, all sales of weapons to Israel must never be conditional. Uh, we have absolutely no evidence that Biden is going to be open to Palestinian concerns. And we have to be very careful as Palestinians and those who might show solidarity with Palestinians not to let Trump be the one who set the bar. Look, Trump is terrible. Trump is transactional. He's pro-Zionist because he either doesn't know any better or he thinks he's going to get evangelical votes in the South. But Biden is an actual Zionist. Like, he actually believes in these things from a geopolitical strategy point of view. And that's very dangerous. And so far, he's told us that he might return things to the way they were under the Obama administration, you know, restoring funding to UNRWA, open up a PLO mission in D.C., but very, very importantly, without Jerusalem. He said very clearly he won't move the embassy back to Tel Aviv. He won't even consider it. He said very clearly before that if there weren't an Israel, we'd have to invent one. He said very clearly before, I'm a Zionist. These are things that Palestinians in America and Arabs in America and those who profess solidarity with the Palestinian question here in America need to take very seriously and question very seriously. And if you stay quiet during a campaign, no matter how you end up voting, but if you stay quiet during a campaign, well, that's approval of what he's doing and saying, and it's not going to win you a meaningful seat at the table when things are done. It's okay. Let me say to Arabs around the world and Arabs in America, it's okay to say no to a politician every now and then. It's okay to be oppositional. You don't have to jump and scream when he says inshallah on TV. You don't have to jump and scream when he says he's better than Trump. His policies are very, very dangerous for us. They've been very dangerous for us, and we have to be very clear and critical about that. Amir Zahra, thank you. Thank you. After the break. From rampant environmental destruction to the staggering death toll of the U.S. war on drugs, can collective acts help to heal collective trauma? We ask legendary Holy Mountain and El Topo filmmaker Alejandro Jodorowsky about his new film, Psycho Magic, A Healing Art. All this and more coming up in part two of Going Underground. <laughs> <laughs>